think of the wearables um, that you know we've heard this morning as well um, that make the buzz. We hear a lot of that, about them, uh, and we also hear that doctors say that okay, these wearables they make the buzz, but it's only for the happy few, for the rich, the healthy ones. What about the others, the many others who are chronically ill? Um, you know, what, what's your view on that? W w which kind of investments actually do you uh, focus on? Which side? Well, I think when you speak about some of the wearable buzz and where it's come out of, it's come out of the U.S. first um, to some extent, and a lot of that's been driven through the high cost of care or the quality of care, and the element then of goes into self-care, and I take more control over what I'm doing. Um, the buzz itself and, and where wearables come in, I think we're, what we're speaking about is an adoption curve in anything. And uh, a simple example is you brush your teeth every day, but it's not something you think about doing, you just do. Now, there's many other attributes of health, you know, through wearables that as they become more developed and, and uh, easier fit into lifestyle, the thing is, you don't think about it. They're just there um, producing an, uh, data to drive an outcome that you would like. And so as the adoption picks up, I think it will more and more spread into the wider population. Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, regarding adoption, I'm very interested to hear about Vishal and Klaus' opinion. Uh, you talk about the user, the end user's adoption, but this is maybe a B2 kind of C model, uh, perhaps, first. Um, some of the portfolio companies you invested in may be a B2B. So by the time the adoption of the end users, you know, get scaled, um, you know, it can be a long time. So which are the companies you think, uh, you know, are capable of uh, well, getting the right adoption? Specifically, if you, if you talk about wearables, the problem, uh, mo the bigger problem than adoption is the attrition rates. So uh, after about three months of, of buying an, a wearable device, uh, two-thirds of the users are no longer using that device. So if you are in the business of selling the device, you don't care. But if you're in the business of making value for having this device with people for longer periods of time, and I believe the reason why there is such a, such a high attrition rate is because the value that the, the current wearables, which we are, we are in the infancy stage of, of, of where, where wearables are, the most of the value is added in that period of time. People don't know how active they are. And then they get a fair idea of how active they are. And after three months, it stops adding incremental value to the time it takes for you to charge it a few, few nights later and st stuff like that, and it just falls. And, and this time, actually, you know, Klaus, and you have great experience with your portfolio companies. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, you know, I, by that time, cash yeah. could. Uh, you, you, can, you can stretch the word variables. We, if you like, we also have companies having variables, but we would call it we would call it sensors which are placed in the body and stay in the body so it's in a var it's a variable in a way um, one of our companies has developed an, uh, an sensor where you can measure intraocular pressure patients with glaucoma you know have the problem the pressure is too high and you have to monitor on a regular basis you can't do that these days because you have a doctor and this company has developed a sensor which is placed inside the eye or outside the eye and for the first time you can continuous measure the eye pressure under therapy and what data now comes out companies in clinical trials is that for the first time you see how inaccurate the therapy these days is because the pressure is fluctuating and for the first time you can record that you can adjust therapy and in a case in, in this case it's a variable but it's hard to copy because if you have it in your body you would not change it um, compared to a jawbone which you would replace by a fit band or what you ha what have you so I think we, as from an investor standpoint, we're looking into <coughs> devices which are locking in the patient. So we hardly could invest in variables which you can exchange, if you like. Uh, and therefore, uh, I think uh, we have to differentiate with, between B2B or B2C. We're currently only doing B2MDC, uh, so B to the medical doctor and then to C, rather than to B to C directly, uh, for the reason that our, our company is all developing serious stuff so it's always including a physician to implant it, to watch it, and so on. So maybe, if, maybe if I can just follow on to a couple of further comments made. I think what you also see is it may start in the consumer side, um, but there's also the aspect where it's coming into the, the health system side. And as things move forward, it's really a convergence, and it's not uh, an individual may pick it up on their own or may get it through the health system. 
as more and more of the wearables uh, become uh, move beyond early adoption into more mainstream elements. Um, and it's not one or the other, it's what issue is trying to be solved that, that comes into play. Um, and, and it depends. In, in the case of what uh, Klaus is mentioning, very heavy um, need of specific monitoring that is heavy medical versus a lifestyle element, um, there, there's a difference. And so it's all about health and what you're trying to solve in that spectrum. But you all three of you have mentioned the value out of this and uh, you know, the value-based outcome of this, the data as well, um, because this is a convergence between you know, what is a value for the healthcare system and also for the patients. So if you have to choose a startup to invest in that actually generates very um, relevant, contextually relevant uh, data, which type of data do you think are relevant? Because you can have all types of data, vital signs, the nutrition things, these are all the, I guess, the convergence between your different worlds of companies. So, I, I think, the, then I'll let you guys, uh, I'll go ahead and show So, so I, I think that it's very hard as a VC to invest in a business that's a pure play data, data play, right? To, to, it's very hard for us to invest in a business that will just sit there and collect large amounts of data and say, at some point, we'll figure out what to do with it. I mean, that's, that's quite hard. Although, there may be a business model to do that. There may be a huge amount of value in, in, in doing that. And I think probably some of the earlier talks in, in the morning were about publicly funded programs where they're aggregating large amounts of data. And hopefully, they will release this API, and some of these companies will be able to utilize that. So I, I personally do not see, see, see us doing a deal in, in a company that would do large, just pure data, data play. And, and I think. Um, our investment philosophy is that, that these days all these startups need to have different levels of business models. So you have a device which enables to collect the data first, then you have the data, and of course data owned by a patient, but you can do a business model together with the patient if you like to use the data for science, for developing or for, for, for getting a better treatment uh, in the future. So I think um, at the end of the day you need, if you talk about data, some way to measure the data, to generate the data. So for us, if you think about a value chain, we always like to you have a sensor, uh, in our understanding, our sensors, right, which can't be replaced if you like, collect data. And after this collection of data, then business models emerge. We have one very nice example in the diabetes field where the company has developed an insulin pen, which is uh, measuring the insulin dose injected and sending that value to the cloud. And then for the first time, the physician can see whether the patient has injected the right dose uh, at the right time. Um, this is something which creates value to the patient because he knows that he has injected the right dose and the physician knows well he has injected at the right time, namely 30 minutes after he measured blood glucose and not two hours later. These are things which we are looking at um, that we really make a difference in the therapy uh, which means at the end of the day you improve outcomes. Yeah. But at the end of the day, our companies have to prove outcome improvement. That's no I way. I think that really is the, the case. Um, data itself, what outcome, whether it be on an individual basis or a basis through the health system, what outcome is being driven by it? Because if I'm an individual and I want to do something about my health, data itself isn't helping me. It needs to be uh, uh, put in a form that is helping me to drive an outcome. Uh, and that gets into behavior elements within the lifestyle side and the deeper you go it's also data in that is helping the health system understand to help also drive an outcome. So, so Steve in your case the, um, the lifestyle type of startups do they actually their payer or the consumers themselves and in which case it's a different profile of companies you're investing? Well I think that um, what you're finding now is so a proposition can start and the consumer will start to pay, um, but more and more if, if it's driving a preventative uh, outcome, you will see insurance elements uh, come into play where they may want to drive awareness on a particular disease area um, and start paying for some of that. And then you have, we were discussing the data element that gets generated uh, from what's happening in the aspect of uh, you have to be careful, of course, data, it's, it's private, but how it's used, it, it can be used in different ways, and that's another model that starts um, being paid for. 
And then you have the health system. I mentioned the individual coming to the center. Um, more and more, and we've heard today, being paid for outcome or value-based outcome versus service, um, more and more the aspect of uh, them coming in and, and needing to attach themselves to the individual and different lifestyle aspects depending on, I mean, from activity through um, uh, different, different apps for looking at skin or whatever it may be, uh, this drives, drives that engagement. And, and so for the outcomes paid by insurers, for instance, um, uh, you know, by the time they pay, I don't know if there are any insurance companies in the room. Uh, can you raise your hands? <laughs> okay, perhaps they are shy. I'm not yeah, but <laughs> but the thing is, um, I, I, you as VC, um, what are the providers of startups who can actually deal with the insurance right. and and get reimbursement be, before they they get scaled? Because your time is counted, yeah. right? I mean, we, when we do our due diligence, and that has changed over the years, we actually have one big bullet point in the DD, which is talk to payers. And uh, of course, every country might be different, but of course, because we are in Germany, it's quite complicated. You know that we have more than 100 health insurance companies, small ones, large ones. We uh, look very early to contact them. And you wouldn't be, su you are surprised these days how open they are to entertain innovation and think about this innovation. Also, when it comes down to reimbursing thing, you can talk a lot about it, but they want to see certain results and the results are not sufficient if you sh just show a quality of life improvement that's fine in Germany at least these payers want to see cost savings unfortunately for startups here in the room they want to see short-term cost savings which uh, in some indications and you can imagine is very hard to show you need two years three years to show that and uh, in this period they might not reimburse your product which is it's, it's, it's a shame because at the end of the day a startup needs to be funded blah 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 but if you make it and we have an, an example in in the eye diseases amblyopia with kids we managed our company to get reimbursement for digital therapy which is a computer game the kids are playing to improve vision loss uh, for in, with kids with amblyopia you know they are patched and they get on the t on the on the computer play three 30, uh, 30 minutes a day for 90 days and the health insurance company pays for that and they are not paying for that without a doctor involved. The doctor needs to monitor the outcome of this treatment, if you like. And as a matter of fact, the outcome is quite positive. Uh, therefore, more and more health insurance companies now starting reimburse this product. Uh, would I have expected that it's going to happen so that quickly? No. Okay. But now all insurance companies look to, for innovation and, of course, uh, the target group of kids is a very emotional group. The parents put pressure on the system. So you find areas where this works nicely. Is this also the same experience, Vishal, that you've had? Perhaps? We, we also look for, for reimbursement. We also look for, um, I, I, in terms of cost savings. So um, in Britain, we have something called NICE, National Institute of Clinical Excellence. And that has set the standard of, of based on qualities of how much money you can, you can save using a particular product. So um, often we have entrepreneurs coming who, who just assume that because this is a better product than the one before, it is going to be accepted, it is going to save costs, and it, people are going to pay for it. None of these things happen. None of the, these things happen unless you have to de you demonstrate those. And which is why there was a, uh, a lot of interest in digital health uh, early on where people thought, you know, you could build these billion dollar businesses with a few hundred thousand dollars of investment. Um, that doesn't really, really hasn't happened, unfortunately, to us. Uh, and uh, I, th I agree with Klaus. I think there is going to be trials. There are going to be. It's a long journey, and entrepreneurs should be should be prepared for that. But um, I think there is a huge amount of opportunity for entrepreneurs uh, in the room uh, to build things in digital health. It, healthcare is littered with obsolete ideas. These ideas which belong to the last century or the century before that, even. And those things continue to happen because no one has tried to change that system. So all entrepreneurs in the room find those obsolete ideas and try and fix them. Oh, the, it seems that there's a question right here. <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah, this is. Uh, you're welcome to uh, add your question. The world of VCs are really uh, very far away for many of us. Uh, it's a it's a completely different world. So, so At who least are you perhaps I'm coming from Pharma, Hoffmann, Roche, okay. um, but I'm sure there are many in this audience 
the world of venture capitalists are a completely weird and very far away, yeah. Yeah. even <laughs> speaking a language only few of us understand. So um, maybe one of the important questions might be if uh, um, there are new services, new ideas coming down the road and uh, we are looking for capital, what kind of evidence, how much evidence do we require bef uh, to collect uh, um, before we talk to you? Um, Mr. Stöckermann from Mr. Peppermint, you indicated uh, it's a prerequisite to have a business case. I guess a value proposition is what's, what's of interest to you. But the value proposition is really not easy to establish. So how much evidence do you require to even talk to startups? I mean, in our case, we talk to these people very, very early. What I say at the end of the journey with a founder very early on, if we come together as an outcome, there is a business case, then, then that might be a project. We don't expect that you table as a business case and where we tick boxes, that never will work anyway. But I think it's more about that, uh, that a startup person or a founder is interacting with the VC early on and explain the idea and then together you develop the business case, you make a sounding to health insurance company for example, to clinicians, blah blah blah, and then at the end of the day you come to a decision that that's worthwhile to pursue. Because you're a farmer, I can tell you an example, we're currently sponsoring with Bayer and Carl Zeiss the first eye accelerator in Europe where the farmer guys put in a decent amount of money, the medtech guy put money, we as a VC put very little money, we put in more brain um, um, <laughs> to the equation. And as a matter of fact, nine, nine, nine startups have now enrolled into the accelerator only on eye diseases from eight different countries. And the reason why Pharma is doing it because they are searching for new ideas. Very early, the business case is not set. All of these eight have an idea what they want to do. It is in, in a way in eye diseases, but what the product will be is quite open. But through this acceleration process, for the first time, I believe that that could be an avenue for you guys from Pharma to enter into that thing. But you have to uh, leave old things behind and just be open to entertain that idea. Can I pick that up? Um, I started in venture capital in 2000. And at that time, uh, I had a portfolio of companies that had products which we wanted to sell to Hoffman La Roche. And at that time, in Hoffman La Roche, there were only two people uh, who used to be in, in licensing. Um, I'm not oh, joking. That this has is changed. It has, so in 2006, I checked, they had 28 people in, in licensing. And then that has grown. So every industry realizes where the, where the innovation is coming from and then modifies the, uh, accordingly. And I think VCs have also changed. So it's, it's not, uh, it, a lot of people assume that the relationship with VCs is very transactional. That's not how it happens. It's very, very rare that we get a business plan that is just the kind of business plan that we wanted to see. And then the entrepreneurs are just like the kind of entrepreneurs we wanted to see. And they were looking for exactly the kind of money that we had to invest. <laughs> it, it rarely happens that way. The best entrepreneurs that, that we back are the ones who we have been in touch with for a long time. Sometimes in a previous company in which we may or may not have invested in, where we, we, we clock the guy and say, look, this guy is really great. He comes up with great ideas. So that's how, and one of the greatest disappointment I have when I compare the Silicon Valley VC model and the European VC model is that entrepreneurs don't build that long-term relationship with, with investors over a period of time. We only see them when they have a business plan. They, they assume that without a business plan, they can't approach a VC. And I don't think that's how most VCs are. And if there are VCs like that, they must change. Oh, okay. can, I, can, I just, a, can I just yeah. pick up on that? Would you, sure. Do you see then that for venture capitalists, private equity, you can see participating in ecosystems as one of the people who are trying to pump prime innovation. So could you see yourself sitting, al sitting alongside a Qualcomm, sitting alongside a pharma company, actually at the early stage of that, uh, of that innovation and development? Well, we, we have a fiduciary responsibility to have a return on our investment. So we will only invest in those businesses where we reasonably believe that there will be a return on, on capital. We cannot invest in ecosystems from our fund money. We may invest in ecosystem from our management fee if we believe that there is value. And, and more and more that you will see that 
uh, VCs and corporate investors are al uh, investing alongside, uh, much more so than it was 10 years ago, for so, example. So I think we, we see the collaboration, that type of collaboration yes. between yes. all of the stakeholders involved in M Health is sort of critical. And, uh, and the challenge to the three of you then, okay, is that you know, by the end of this year, the ECH Alliance will have 25 ecosystems um, uh, across, across Europe and further afield. And one of, our, one of our innovations is to actually pump prime and assist SMEs and startups by actually having effectively a form of corporate shark tank where we actually put technology businesses alongside pharma, alongside some of the government commissioners so that we can actually drive both the development of the innovation and its, and its implementation. So please get involved. Yeah, I just maybe just add on to that. I think that um, what Vishal said is absolutely right. There needs to be a return out of it. From, but what you see, the new venture capital is more and more Im embedding themselves and involved in the ecosystems. Um, as and Klaus had mentioned, as if it's bringing a particular knowledge point in, so it's more than just money brought in to the equation. Um, it's also the knowledge of. You know, how are these companies, how can they be built within the ecosystem that exists um, that comes into play? So, and I also would like to say Weird is a very nice name for VXCs because they've, we've been called much worse. <laughs> but, but it's. <laughs> I, have, I have actually a comment because I've uh, noticed from you, you are very maternal, maternal with your companies. Yes. So, this is the after, after raising money, the startups get. Because you pronounce we, the word we, yes. it seems that you are actually going to the insurance companies, you are working with the, your startup. So what kind of uh, mothers are you for the, <laughs> you know, of the companies? Uh, can you just pass I mean, in one you have to <laughs> You have to ask the CEOs. I mean, I, I, I may leave the room before. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I think at the end of the day, they would appreciate at a later time that we were challenging them, but it's not only challenging, it's only guiding him and, and sounding with them together because we, we, we move in new directions. As I described this, uh, this digital therapy for amblopia, of course, when we first went for the first health insurance company, they were sitting there saying, what do you, we patch the kids all the time. Why would we need a digital therapy? And it takes time to, to socialize and explain that you are not bullshitting. Of course, at the end of the day, show me the clinical data. Of course, then you have to show them clinical data. But I think it's really a cooperation for a certain period of time and working very closely with the founders. And I said before, I'd rather see a founder today and he leaves the room and I see him back two years again while he is working on his business idea and I stayed in contact with them than waiting and sitting in Berlin and waiting to get a 100% business plan, which never will happen anyway. So all founders send me everything you have, and we have a chat. Okay. And Vishal, Steve, uh, your views about um, this? I think that w w so the best relationships are where the VC is as excited to get involved with the company as the company is as, ex as excited to be involved with, with, with the VC. So, so that's what the best deals are. The deals that get momentum within our firms are the ones where that relationship becomes obvious very early on. And then, you know, being a part of your business allows us, gives us an excuse to talk about you all the time. And in that way, it's, it's, it's very maternal in the sense that you want to talk about your child. Your child did something which might be quite silly, but you want to talk about it all the time. So when we meet insurers, when we meet potential acquirers, we're always talking about our businesses. So this is, this is what one of the things we, we do. And if, you know, there are a lot of VCs in this world, and I would, would urge every entrepreneur to think very hard who to get on board to your business. Talk to them and think about it. This is the guy or a, a, you know, a, a man or a woman. I use guy in a unisex uh, uh, way. This is the guy you're going to spend a lot of time in the next five years with. And, this is what, and you should have that kind of relationship where you can, you can be frank with each other and say, actually, that, that may not work. You shouldn't feel like saying, well, I have to say that this might work because I might hurt his feeling. Okay. That just doesn't Very work. Transparent Very transparent. Very transparent. Is it the same for you, Steve, as well? Absolutely. I think Vishal said it quite well, as well as Klaus. It, it, it's, first off, I think two things. You know, entrepreneurs really have to say, well, this is a long-term relationship. Do I really want to get up in the morning and speak to this person? <laughs> um, is this somebody I want to, I, I want to associate with? Um, the the other aspect, I think, is um, when it, making a partnership is what Michelle said. How do you, you know, we only like to get involved with companies we truly believe we can help build. 
and it's about building companies um, because at the end of the day if you've built a company there's value and that's the return um, and so it's the like-minded element and I always say to entrepreneurs you should do as much due diligence on me as I'm going to do on you so it seems that it's long-term relationships it starts very long before it, you actually invest in and also long afterwards um, we have still more uh, perhaps one minute question and we're going to conclude this panel uh, this session is there any question in the audience Yeah, one question. So coming back to the subject, um, which are hot areas to invest in mobile has, have you already seen um, promising startups or startups that um, are successful so far? And um, can you name them uh, or can you name some showcases? I, I think, well, within digital health, you're seeing a staged approach and a phased approach. If we go into activity monitoring, you're already seeing exits happening at some substantial values. Um, and, and as I look at the wave now, it's going deeper into the health uh, elements or the chronic disease area. And so that's the next wave. And, and we're seeing a buildup of, I think, a number of promising companies. Um, in the aspect, I think everybody's waiting to, to point to that one company and saying, here's the business model, or here's the success. Um, that's coming, it's emerging, and there's promising companies is how I would characterize it. So the best companies are the ones that are on the portfolio page of our website. <laughs> Those are the best companies. So and, the, and the ones that we haven't invested in, we're not going to tell you which ones those are. <laughs> yeah. and, and Klaus, what about you? Well, I mean, to take that question more seriously, I mean, the, que the, que the, que the question is... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> What, what do you want to what, what do you want to hear here? I mean, successful. What does it mean? Uh, has the company built a, a digital health case, became profitable, and now is worth a billion, right? I don't think that there is a company out there so far, right? Is there a company which uh, thrilled me all the time? There actually is one. That's basically in China, and I think this is a fertility uh, uh, tracking app. Forgot the name of the company there, but I suppose they have obviously 45 million users tracking the fertility. Now the question comes, how they make money? If you think they just charge one euro per month, it would be a great business, right? I don't know how they were able to, whether, where they are in terms of monetization, the 45 million users. Um, to your question now, actually, we are looking for these really tremendous successes in that space, to be honest, because then it would be much easier to raise money for our funds this is now really testing the waters and proof that you can make money with digital health companies. So thank you very much for your qu question. So as a conclusion, can you give one word uh, about your future dream startup in which you're going to invest tomorrow? You know, for the audience, each of you. Uh, one word. <laughs> okay, I'm generous, two words. <laughs> China. <laughs> <laughs> there we have it. That's <laughs> geographically, but um, I, I think it's just digital. There's your one word. It will be in digital. Okay, thanks, Steve. Unicorn. Unicorn. Yeah. These are very rare, but very, very special. Okay. What about you, Klaus? China or? <laughs> I stick with my portfolio company. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much uh, to these great speakers. Um, I'd like to give a warm applause to them. You are going, you are going to get a presentation of uh, each of you, um, each of the speakers, uh, after you know, uh, this uh, session. Um, and again, thanks a lot for your great insights. They will be around, so you can you know, catch them whenever you can and you know, ask any questions you want. Thanks a lot to you. Thank you.